everybody for coming. This is the, the panel on AV sampling. And uh, we've got a few guests with us this evening who come from kind of various different backgrounds, all doing different things, but along the same theme. And uh, I've got, I guess to introduce everybody, I kind of asked for, for a minute video uh, from each person, just to kind of get an idea. Uh, what, what kind of people have we got in the room here? We got indus industry professional kind of people, uh, people working in education, yeah, all right. Artists, a lot of artists. People that can't be categorized. Yeah, some of them, yeah, okay, good. Have we got any lawyers? No, that's good, all right. Um, great. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to run through and introduce each person first of all then and just show a little video to, to round them up. And then if you want to talk um, at that moment and just introduce yourself a little bit so that we've got... You've got a mic over there, Matt? Yeah, you're starting, Matt. We'll share this one, yeah. So, um, yeah, this, this was the bit of text that was kind of like the premise to this. Uh, so I'll just put that up there so you guys can read it again so you know what this panel is about. Um, it's been a busy day. just want to re refresh that. Um, so yeah, the use and abuse of audiovisual sampling. Challenges, technical, creative. And uh, so let's have a look at who we've got on the panel. Um, first up, we've got Matt Black from Cold Cut. Yep. Some of you may know him from Ninja Tune Records. And he sent me this little video. Quite a build up to this one, man. Cut. My first ever computer animation. That was. Are we allowed to, to talk? Do you want to just introduce yourself? Are you going to play the whole five minutes? Um, I've got it here, but I'd, I'd like to cut it a bit yeah. shorter than that. Just play the one after this. This is Timber, which was uh, Stuart Warren Hill, we made this with, said, what you see is what you hear, which I think puts it quite well. Actually, the loop is from, uh, no, I better not say, there might be a secret lawyer here, but it's not just made from axes. It's often you start with the sound and then paste stuff on top. We found that's a good way to work. This we found we could like film our own stuff and cut that together with computer animation and cut it up ourselves. So not just sampling from existing sources, but making our own samples. And um, yeah, this was a little showreel I made called Directions in AV. And I guess the conclusion that I came to after uh, these years of working with it is that it's great fun playing with sound and vision and you can make the relationships up. They're not necessarily literal. If I kick a football and record the sound and record the visual, that's fairly literal, but I can put any sound in any image together and create relationships. All um, right. You can, can also, I, yeah, go on. I'm gonna just keep it moving and get yeah, around do. to everybody and then we'll come back and get into some more Please. details as well. Vicky Bennett, so uh, next on the How much of mine will you play? Because I, I might tell you where, how far forward to go. I'll start it. It's two, uh, it's, well, I, I just want to play it and then talk. It's, right. it, it's two minutes, 14 long, so go how far in you want to give me and just play it and then I'll very yeah, briefly. I don't, I don't think I have the control. Oh, let me have a look. Yeah, and along yeah, the you, bottom. No? Yeah, you can drag that along. Yeah. There, there you go. So Something go like in that. about, go in a bit further. Okay. No, no, no. For back, 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 back. Okay. All right. I'll Around talk there. after. Okay. You turn it up. So this is part of a, a 360 install. I'll tell you after.
Okay, you can turn it down now, I'll talk. Okay. So that's something I've made. It's a simulation of something that's made for 10 screens and eight speakers uh, for a place called Cine Chamber, uh, which is recombinant media labs in San Francisco. And um, so the, the, the film is made by making a very, very long, thin strip of film, a very, very wide movie that then gets put into an After Effects project. And the sound is uh, Pro Tools sampling, uh, if we're going to be technical about it. And I've been making uh, music and video and radio uh, as people like us since 1991. All right, cool. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, we move along to Mr. Graham. It's funny, like the way that I lined yeah. it up in the presentation is how you all sat down. Didn't plan that. Meant to be. Um, but yeah, here's a little bit of Graham then. <coughs> Uh, ben just asked for a minute and a half or so, so just quickly cut up a few bits. No, no, that's not me. No. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm still, I'm not really a keynote kind of guy, but here, let, I'll give it a shot. How about that? Yeah, that's it. Just go on then. Oh, there you go. You can turn it up a little bit. I mean, what we do is kind of we're known for kind of cutting up films often and making music out of the sounds that you see. But doing a lot of mashups like that where we'll stick two completely different artists together. This was a commercial job we did for uh, 4DX, for the, first UK, uh, the UK's first 4DX cinema, where they gave us a whole load of movies to cut together. This was an ad we did for Channel 5, where we had to cut a whole thing for Europa League. Um, and this actually is a new project uh, that we're doing, where Instead of just sampling, like Matt was saying, existing media, um, we decided on our travels and gigging around the world to take camera and recording equipment with us and just record musicians all over the planet, everywhere we travelled. And so for five years, six years or so, we've recorded over 200 musicians uh, and then we've sampled them and, and built this whole project called Orchestra of Samples. And it's, it's essentially about bringing people around the world together, albeit digitally. And Graham, you, you have a partner anyway. that you work with, and you kind of do the audio and video. Yes, yeah, it's just, sorry, it's me and Mark, just two of us, there's me and Mark. And we do all the music, and we do all the editing and video and everything, yeah. and go out there and perform it. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. Us. All right, we'll move it along. Brian, where's Gardner, mate? Right. Um, does he get a bit shy? Does he? He's, he's with us. Yeah. He's with us. That's good. Well, I asked Brian for a video. He sent me this, um, yeah. <laughs> which I thought was great. Um, Alexa, what's the weather? Currently, in Cambridge, it's 45 degrees with showers. Tonight, you can look for rainy weather with a low of 43 degrees. Um, so... That's, that's kind of different kind of sampling, actually. That's kind of, that's kind of different, right? But <coughs> introduce us to yourself a little bit and your background, because um, there, there's so, more to it than that. Okay, well, so this is, um, yeah, I've been doing, I've been teaching at Rhode Island School of Design for the last six years, and um, I started a new course uh, last semester in AI design, so we're looking at how designers and artists can approach AI, and, and my thinking that we, we want artists and designers in the front of that not following, but leading the technology people. And this was a project that I did that went viral. Has anyone, did anyone here see this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm also really into the internet and viral videos, and I just absolutely love that. I'm addicted. So that's what that is. Uh, back in the day, uh, Gardner and I have been friends now for since the mid-'80s. We went to school together. Um, he was a sculptor. I was a painter at the time. We both had this sort of interesting obsession with, with looping cartoons and... Um, I think it's mostly based on um, collage and surrealism. So that, that for us is sort of what we wanted to do. But both of us have been doing these uh, sculpture for the last 10 years. And, um, anyways, and it's, it's very cool that there's a whole culture that's emerged around the, the AV cut-up stuff. Um, I, I actually did, you, you did something just downstairs a, a little while ago as well. 
I just did a, a quick little show, yeah. Yeah. I, I actually picked up my favorite little video from the internet of your stuff as well, because I saw okay. the fish, and I like the fish, but I just, I, I wanted to get a little uh, bit of that. Emergent. Is that all right, or no? <laughs> okay, I got it in, I got it in there, I got it in. Um, I'd rather have us talking than watching. Yeah, yeah, work, for sure. You know. um, that's fine, Johnny, I'll just uh, what? Uh, get on to you. Oh, so there's Gardner, he's here. He is here, come on up. Oh, okay. Gardner's an amazing oh sculptor, God. so he did all of the all of the the building, the, the, the you know the um, the vehicles, the tell podium launcher, um, can continue all of that, and he continues to make um, the best sculptures in the world. Like he's awesome. we'll throw the mic down there later, huh? Okay, everybody turn around <laughs> and face Gardner. Yeah. <laughs> So, Johnny, I got the little video that you sent over as well, so I'll just play this and... Eclectic Method! Eclectic Method sucks. Pray to Kangaroo. I'm so confused! <laughs> Eclectic message shot. I fucking hate eclectic method. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I, I started out wanting to be a DJ, and then I saw Matt Black cold cut Hexstatics Timber, and that changed my life. After that, I wanted to do video remixing. Then Matt introduced me to EBN, and uh, that's basically why I do all this. Yeah, okay, great. Well, um, thanks for all being here today. I guess when I was asked to kind of put the little panel together, I started thinking about the subject and how we could break it down into, you know, things to talk about basically. So the first thing that I was looking at was kind of like the historical aspect. Um, because for me, I, I thought sampling had really come out of hip hop. Um, I found a couple of other bits and pieces from 1940s. Uh, some guy was you know, sampling train sound effects in the 40s. That's great. I'll just turn it up a little bit, but it's not very good. He actually made songs out of this though. It was kind of, it was called Music Concrete. It was kind of a French guy going at that stuff. So, there you go. For the historians, that, watch that name. Then there was, well, yeah, you got, you got somebody else. Joseph Cornell. Cornell, yeah. Joseph Cornell, he made, I think he's credited with being the first one to randomly cut up film, put it back together and show it. Yeah, what, what kind of data have we got on that one? Because I think, well, anyway, I mean, there's, there's. This is, I mean, this is people have been having wonder, you know, their different claims. But any, so anyway, I mean, just to, just to kind of, uh, I guess, start with audio, because audio was obviously, you know, sampled before video, from what I could tell. This was, uh, this was another guy who sampled Elvis in the '60s. And <laughs> Was doing some kind of more experimental stuff. Yeah. Anyway, uh, then I found this online, which was actually something that Johnny put together, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, Brief history. Of sampling. This is uh, a mellotron. It's tape loops. So, from 1966 forward, basically Johnny has got you know, a little video up online so you can kind of see a little bit more about the history of, of uh, sampling. But when you were putting this together, Johnny, you obviously did quite a bit of research. Do you want to give us your ideas on, on the history of sampling and how it got started, really? Uh, yeah, I, I got into it because of Public Enemy. That was the first time, I, and the Beastie Boys, obviously, but I think Matt's the only person on the panel who is a pioneer in video and audio sampling. Uh, there was the... Uh, I meant audio and video sampling. 
No, I meant, I meant before he was making videos, he was doing James Brown remixes and, you know, making hit records out of audio samples without the video. So, so Matt may know about this in my mind. I think the first one that I think of, the first one that I think of is actually Curtis Blow, the song America. And they did some cut-ups that were like kind of cut to a scratch thing in there. And that mm, 80X, 85 or something. Uh, I'm good. In in your in your little presentation video there at the beginning, Matt, you had Funky Drummer, which was one of James Brown's probably most sampled. It's probably one of the most sampled bits of music. Yep. And was that a conscious thing that you knew that it had been sampled? Loads? Absolutely. Well, at that point, which was 1988, it hadn't been sampled quite so much. Sure. But it was sort of one of the hottest breakbeats. And we made this record, Say Kids, What Time Is It? And the bit that people really liked that was Funky Drummer, mixed with King of the Swingers from the Jungle Book. And it, it, it's when you put something together that's made out of elements that people know, and then you put them together, then they know that you've made something new. If you just use elements that people don't know, they don't know what you're doing. So sometimes it's good to use references that people actually know. But um, I say, I, I went to Selfridges, saw an Amiga doing this uh, animation of the juggler, which looked a bit like that uh, drummer of mine on the green and yellow background, and thought, hey, that means you could make a film with computer graphics on your desktop. So I bought an Amiga and started messing around. So that isn't, it's not exactly audiovisual sampling. I mean, it, it's a quite of a slippery term. Uh, for me, it's all about AV. Sampling is just one part of it, but that, that is audio sampling with visual synthesis. So sampling is a technique within an art form as opposed to an art form itself? I, I would say so, yeah. yeah. Um, people, have been working with, people have been working with scratch video as well. So, you know, people yeah. working in analog. So before that, people have been working in a DIY way. You know, folk art is sampling. Yeah. And that goes as far I, back as you want to go. I, I mean, in, in some yeah. ways, then Rauschenberg's collages, you know, collage art and stuff like that is kind of sampling as well, sampling so posters. So sampling. Like the two elements, so audiovisual art is putting sound and image together, right? Yeah. Leonardo da Vinci was doing that, I think, in the 12th century whenever he was around, for the, the court of the royal court, he would produce these amazing spectaculars where they would have fireworks and music and colored light. So that's audiovisual entertainment in an abstract way. So that's been going on from time. And then sampling is more of a 20th century invention because the technology to actually sample images and sample sounds didn't really exist before then. The way to sample sound, I guess the first was the record, then the tape recorder was more flexible. Photography is a way of sampling, if you like, and yeah, film and cinema is a yeah. way of sampling. There's, um, I think sampling is taking pre-existing material and combining it with something else. Sure, yeah. Is so, Vicky, yeah. on that note, what do you think it is about sampling that attracts artists? What, why do artists want to mix elements together in that way? Uh, maybe because it's the palette of our time. You're working with um, th everything that's around you. Um, and so therefore, you've got the ability to transform with a, with a medium that's most effective for distribution, use the medium itself. Yeah. The medium is a me message. And, um, that, and I guess that's why it's, it's also attractive to an audience. They're, they're kind of responding to it in that way. You, in but I think it's also just because some people get a kick out of it. I mean, why do people like rock climbing? You know, why do people like doing anything? I think that a lot of us who do this just like doing it you know you, you like to take little bits of something and build something completely new out of other little bits but there's there's something there's some kind of emotional context in in that that mixing procedure the alchemy of it kind of that uh, the enjoy that's that's where the enjoyment comes from I guess I guess there's there's different different ways of mixing things together whether you're doing it for political or entertainment or you know to have a message um, and that's something that it kind of runs through this whole panel I think like several of you have, have done things that have come from those political, emotional kind of contexts. Uh, Brian, you, you kind of have had a couple of videos in, uh, well, that, I, that I've seen that, that have this kind of political message and it's used as a, a way to, to kind of express those ideas. Um, yeah, so <coughs> we were talking about this earlier. Um, I guess it's there. I mean, initially it was because that was what was on TV, you know? So we, in many ways, TV doesn't exist now the way it did in the 80s, even the 90s. Um, but that's what was coming out the pipe, you know? That was, yeah, that's the, the giant 
sewer pipe delivering, you know, <laughs> 24 hours of filth into your home. So it's like, you know, let's slice that up and see what comes out. But know? on the one side, but so there's this entertainment factor, but on the other side, it can be used for, for spreading a message, basically. I don't know. If did you find did you find creating those works enjoyable, or did did you? Oh, feel it was very enjoyable. Um, but th so to getting back to what, so there's the other thing that wasn't mentioned yet is so looping, and repetition are two um, techniques that transform uh, images into music. And there's something about the loop, you know, and like the repetition that I don't know what it is, but it's j it, it's it, the same it, as tribal it's, drumming. It's, it's like a tribal drumming. It's a <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looping is a great technique, isn't it? And I'm sure we've all got into the hypnotic effect of loops, which can drive you nuts, actually, when you realize you've been working on something and listening to the same loop for like two hours. But so when something's repeated, it becomes a pattern, and humans like patterns. Right, so we've, we're looking for patterns, we're creating patterns, and that is, I think is a big part of the attraction to it. I think w what I noticed with EBN's early work was that you were very good at finding the internal rhythms in bits of footage. That if a piece of footage just plays once, you don't necessarily latch onto the rhythm, but it is possible to do that. And I've known good scratch DJs as well, like Kid Koala, be able to do that, or Strictly Kev, would you agree with this? Like, you play a sound, you latch on to a rhythm or a part of it that can be looped, and you think, I'm going to repeat that, and you start repeating it, and then it becomes a pattern, a groove, something that you can groove along to. That's part of it, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's just the visuals, too. Right, so, you know, like, so when hip-hop... Hip hop was a new type of music. It was this thing that was like all loops and repetition and using um, found found materials and had a different sound. And so that was what we were stewing in for months. And you know, all, a lot of what you're talking about came from that. But um, it's visual, so don't forget the V. And the loops and the elements have to work visually. So if you take something, if you just do the sample based on the sound, it might not work right on screen. I mean, you can change it or mess it around, but. Um, so. you know yeah, no, I was gonna say, I definitely know about that. That's because that, video often has its own rhythms. Uh, that, that's the thing. And sometimes they don't quite match up with the audio. I don't mean uh, literally. I mean, in the sense that say um, uh, a drummer, say you take you, the drum sound, obviously audio wise, it's starting at the point that the, the drumstick would be hitting the skin, you know. Whereas obviously video-wise, if you show show it from that point, it doesn't work. It looks stupid because you want it, you need at least a few frames to see the arm going down and hitting the drum. Of which obviously is then it doesn't qu quite fit, if that makes sense, with with the uh, with the uh, the audio. And so yeah, you, you, when you're building something, you do need to. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. need that sort of gap. I, that, I that's thinking, yeah. That's <laughs> about asking about this actually. So I, I call them lead-ins, yeah. right? If you've got an ax hitting a tree, if you just start it at the point that the it's ax the has hit the tree, it you've got, sense. it makes no sense. You've got to have the yeah. goom, like that. Yeah. Now in vocals, quite often you, and I've been working on with our software, which is an audio looping software, Ninja Jam, and it's, it's great, apart from when you've got vocals that come in before the, the beat, yeah. and that's called a pickup. It's a, if I could be you, be you, yeah. B's on the downbeat, but the if I is a lead in. And actually, software is hard. It doesn't deal with loops very well, so that's a technical problem. Yep. Another technical thing to do is sampling. A lot of it came about through um, uh, limitations. So, I mean, the, the first, I mean, the first sampling machines like on an Amiga, you got like an 8-bit sampler for Titan Amiga as well, right. 26 quid cartridge sampler you stick it in the back and you you know you've got a tiny amount of yeah you've got a really tiny amount to loop and you kind of so you you're very strategic in how you use your memory and then 
you know, sampling keyboards when they have floppy disks, you know, you, you might get eight seconds or something like that and then have to change the disk over. So a lot of went on was to do with limitations. And, and if you think about tape loops, you know, yeah, you might have the radiophonic workshop have it go across the room, but most people are going to do a tape loop that's quite small. So everything is based upon repetition due to a limitation of technology or money. It's kind of an open question, but we're kind of getting onto technique a little bit now. And I just wonder how some of your techniques will have changed over the course of the last 20 years. Because, you know, there, there was analog media um, and you've worked through that stage to now what is digital media. How have your processes changed or are you still use old techniques to try and do what you're doing? Johnny? With, uh, when I started, it was a lot easier. Uh, Matt and EBN had to invent their own software to do it. Uh, to do the video editing, video sampler. Cold Cut came up with VJAM with CamArt, which was a video sampler. And EBN had a bunch of different software they used to do their live show. So I think it was a lot harder. Now it's really easy. Now we all carry laptops around with us before we had to carry like five flight cases to do a show. And yeah, so it's got a lot easier. And now, yeah, it's just a laptop. And, uh, I, I don't think it's got too easy. I think. Because still, this whole field is just still really difficult. And so uh, I, I don't see it getting very easy for quite a long time. Because I think it's still a form that people don't understand. I think people still don't quite get it. Or they see it and go, wow, this is amazing, and still don't quite understand it. Say, so can you, you know, do what you do with, you know, and they'll give you something completely different. And, 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 and say maybe, they'll say, can you do something with this, but with somebody else's music? And you say, no, but that's not what we're doing. We're making music out of the sort of clips and out of the sounds. And so people can see it and love it, but still not actually understand it. So I, I don't think it's getting too easy. Well, and is it that, you know, the, there's so much stuff available now digitally that, you know, what, I guess the difficulty in the past was getting the right sample now everything is available at your Just fingertips. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the wrongs, yeah. The, the, I think the limitation you have to create for yourself, um, where technology created a, a discipline for you where thankfully the limitations were enforced creativity, you have to create the limitations yourself because ab with abundance you'll never get anything done and you just make a load of mediocre rubbish. Whereas, um, you, So you actually have to get more discipline within yourself and became, become your own um, editor. I've got to say, like, your piece is, I'd say, the most sophisticated piece of our showreels that's gone up there. And that, that piece would have been it's still technically pretty difficult and it's it's not possible with the simple techniques that we were using. You'd have to have today's video editing software, have a whole editing studio on your laptop to be able to do that. Now, yeah. uh, it's, it's of now, that's right. So I mean that, you know, for me it's wicked because you've, you've pushed things forward. I was looking at that thinking, oh, how should you do that? How did you do that bit? It's actually pretty intricate what you're... Uh, it's, not it, that it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult actually. You don't use any 3D software. Okay, well, 3D software is a is a nightmare, but yeah, okay, yeah, it's really difficult. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, that I think shows your piece shows that this is moving more from like the short cut-up pieces that we did into what is actually filmmaking. And I, I remember a few years ago, I was thinking, well, I I was w in watching more films and thinking actually there is a name for putting sound and music together. It's called film or experimental film, you know, we're doing it in a kind of cut up way, but, and I would like to move more into filmmaking and get more of the poetry and narrative and storytelling. At, and, you know, I don't know if you'd agree with this guys, but we, our pieces were generally a few minutes long. They're like a single length, right? And it's kind of easy to take a theme and spin it out for three or four minutes. If you want to make a film which is kind of an hour to two hours length, it comes to a different level. And um, that's, I think, is a challenge for us is to get over that boundary and take it into a, a more sophisticated, I'd even say grown up, engrossing film story length rather than just these short pieces. So I don't know what people well, think about that. And the next that. generation are going to come along and cut it up and, and, and then <laughs> sample it. So um, by the same token, there's some like unbelievable video art that's been made over the last 25 years. And Christian Markley made this piece called The Clock. 
and I saw that, and it almost made me give up hope because it's so good. It's like so good, so perfect, so everything about it. It's like he did the quartet, but the the clock like is a masterpiece. Um, I don't know if Gardner's still here, if he saw it or not. So you know, people are as simple as our little playing of stuff was back then. Now it's like this very sophisticated thing, right? He did just do that in Adobe Premiere. It's more that it took two years to make, I think. It, I mean, it's an existential masterpiece, what he made. But I think technology-wise, I think we've had that a long time. Not a long time, but, you know, 15 years we've had, like, Adobe Premiere to be making this stuff, you but know. I guess the, the challenge is being able to source all of the samples to make the film, right? I was thinking more on the level of what Matt was saying about doing longer narrative pieces. Um, that's, it is actually a continuous narrative. Like you can sit and watch it as a movie, and and yet it's also a cut up. So it's, it's a like, idea. It's a, I think he's using a very simple idea to make something incredibly complex. So that he's got all the footage he kept was was just finding that time. So it's, it, so it's kind of using a, a very simple idea to do something absolutely that would just crush you otherwise. <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I just yeah. want to move the conversation on to the legality of, of some of these projects as well, because obviously, Ouch. you know, um, getting into longer fi the, the conversation of longer films, a lot of you have cut up films and used them in your works and in some way claimed them as your own. And I've just wondered if any of you have come into any problems doing that, uh, if you've received notices to stop doing that. Uh, wh where's the drama? Is there any drama? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we, we're um, definitely operating on a pretty gray area, yeah. And I think we probably, as artists, would say, like, it's fair use. That would be our defense. But you know? I guess... I guess uh, but, you, you know, you, if, if your stuff gets shown on mainstream media, it's like in music we say, where there's a hit, there's a writ. If you sample the Beatles and make a mixtape for your mates, great. You get that in, uh, in the charts, and you're going to be hearing from the lawyers because there's a substantial amount of money involved. And it, it's like that as well. Our stuff is kind of experimental. It's underground. It, if we take that and, you know, for instance, we made a video. It gets shown on MTV. We can, we're going to get in trouble. Well, when MTV was big, I say in the 90s, or 80s, 90s, whatever. It, it, it's a question of exposure to an extent. But with Timber, for instance, there's that wonderful sample, which is the musical hook. The audiovisual hook of the piece, apart from the chainsaw and the axe, is the native woman singing her sort of song of lament and it's a wonderful audiovisual sample and we got that cleared from the BBC I think and we paid about two and a half grand to get that cleared so I like getting clearance for samples you know you, you get a legal framework you get an agreement they get paid you've got the rights to use it everyone's happy well, so I it can work with Ninja Tune as well you've also released samples for people to use however they want am I writing saying that yeah that's on occasion yeah we've also got badly fucked for sampling without permission as well you know so it can be very expensive and um, it, it, we do operate in a, a gray area and I think we <laughs> literally it's not the most comfortable topic for us because you know if we admit like we have sampled all this stuff we could it is a, I'm gonna say against the law it's a gray area we could get into trouble for it even still but I, I guess Johnny just coming back you you mentioned public enemy I mean they they were a band that claimed that you know due to copyright infringement they had to change their sound yeah De La Soul had it uh, all the hip-hop acts had it I did I did a show for MTV called MTV mash and we had more lawyers working on it than editors and uh, we had to they were constantly working we for example we used Buster Rhymes Wuha on one track we just used his vocal just used his acapella but the legal team had to clear all the samples in the track to be safe because MTV didn't have the rights to edit stuff. They could use it, but as soon as they started uh, messing with it, they needed lawyers to get involved. And so, yeah, that, I mean, w we'd all probably be able to sell a lot more of what we do if we could clear it. I've had really weird experiences where I need, uh, did a BBC Doctor Who thing and then they wanted to put it on TV, but they'd have to clear every clip uh, with the producer, the actor, the, the director of those clips. And so it's actually a lot harder than clear, clearing audio samples because there's also so many different people own the rights. I did stuff for Motown. Motown don't even own the rights to their own videos. The um, videos are owned by like the, the Saturday Night Show and that kind so of thing. So do you think that gray area of who owns what 
means that people can get away with more sampling in a way and, and it kind of go under the radar. Well, the, the flip side to this is then you can also do remixes of stuff that's already popular to take bits of Disney movies and it can get 15 million views and then your name gets bigger and you've kind of used someone else's stuff and helped build your business. Uh, but you haven't, you know, there's a, I, the reason I moved into movie samples is because I used to do mashups and there's all audio copyright ID on YouTube is automated and it's a lot better and movies don't really chase down samples because if they chase down samples, they'd be chasing down every movie show in the world that promotes their movie with bits of the trailer and they can't do that, they don't want to do that. Well, and it's actually turned into work for you as well, Graham, because you've, you've sampled enough movies and made a little art form out of it and, and now that comes back to you as, as work, really. Um, yeah, I mean, we never kind of planned to um, with that. We just, I mean, we once took the idea that we thought instead of just sampling lots of different bits of things and putting it together to make something new, like a collage, which obviously everyone here on the panel does, we thought why not take a whole movie and just sample the movie and sort of squeeze it down to five minutes. And um, so we started doing that in some of our live sets donkeys years ago. And somewhere along the way, someone at New Line Cinema uh, saw it, and that was only in something like 2005, I think it was, uh, and they just contacted us. At first, we thought they were going to sue us. But <laughs> it was, cause in those days, you know, people still called you and left messages on your voicemail, and you'd sort of come in and you'd find, hi, this is Harvey G. Rothenberger III, and from so-and-so in New York, and, you know, I want to, you know, and so you think, oh, shit, something, you know, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't return the call for like three days, and you think, oh, what's going to happen? But um, no, and they asked us to uh, remix um, a film at the time that was coming out, and Antonio Banderas uh, would take the lead. And it was because the film was a true story uh, based on, um, it was, oh, what was it? It was the, it was a documentary that won the Oscar, uh, Mad Hot Ballroom. And it was about a, a guy, a ballroom teacher, who mixed up hip hop with ballroom dancing. And, and, and that was, anyway, it was turned into this film. And because of the nature of it, they wanted to do a trailer that was a bit all kind of remixed and mashed up and cut up. And so they found us, came to us and said, could you do this trailer? And we did, uh, and then, as you say, yeah, after that, without planning, we suddenly started getting emails and calls from various Hollywood studios saying, can you please remix you know, Iron Man, or can you please remix Fast and Furious, and all these kind of films, and so we did. Uh, and yeah, that was kind of a new thing, and then suddenly lots of other people were doing it as well. And then, uh, I've done less of it in recent years, because I think now every kid in his bedroom sort of takes a film and cuts it up, and, and, and that's, I think, kind of, in a sense, what I suppose the panel means in that has AV sampling come of age. I guess in that sense that now, you know, when we were all doing it before YouTube even existed, uh, and now, you know, everybody's doing it, I, I think not to the same degree uh, of finesse uh, and artistry that I think uh, a lot of us are all doing it. They are maybe just taking a few samples and it's more like sort of weird cut up memes or something, but it's, um, yeah. Sorry, that's the long answer. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, I mean, so just to wrap up, and, and then we'll kind of throw it out to the audience a little bit, but your ideas on the future of where the sampling technique or art form uh, might go, given the changes in technology that you've seen? Uh, and well, in fact, we were talking about this last night. Um, tagging, I think that's probably where it'll eventually go. And like Johnny was saying, is that if things can easily be tagged, then you could have some form of of rights royalty collection like you do with music and if you know if somebody w if companies were uh, opening their archives and their back catalogues for people to sample then you know they they could make money out of it as opposed to things just digitally sitting on a shelf gathering digital dust doing nothing for 20 30 40 years you know it would be better like you had when you worked with the BBC that time you know when they opened up the archives and but even then, I remember that had a lot of problems because they had to, as Johnny was saying, they had to clear uh, a, a lot of it. And I think they were only, because I remember we did something where they were only able to clear bits of Tomorrow's World or something at the time because it was, yeah. It, was, yeah. it took them a year to clear it. It took me six months to make it and a year for them to clear it. And it's their own stuff. You know, things have changed a lot since we were doing this a few years ago. You know, I painstakingly built up a video archive clips on the hard drive, use the hard drive die, copy it onto another hard drive, and then sort of, I've realized recently it's completely redundant because there's YouTube now, and a lot of it's on HD on YouTube. My, uh, my archive's pre-HD, and it's pre-YouTube, so actually, <laughs> apart from a curation, you know, it's a collection, but it, it's kind of out of date, and things have, have really moved on. Uh, the rights issue is interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, YouTube 
don't pay very much when our music goes up there. And so why shouldn't we just stick up our mixes on YouTube? It's not like we're trying to sell them. We just want 10 million views or whatever. So the whole paradigm of the, the sort of business structure around it has changed as well. So actually, in a way, we're freer than we, than we were before. It's nice, no? Um, let's throw it open to the audience there. Brian just oh, Brian. Just one comment. So, so one of the things that I think is super cool, <coughs> um, in terms of, so we're, we're, everyone up here is used to audio tagging on YouTube, right? And in many ways, the reason that audio happened first is the same reason that audio happened in sampling first, because it's easier, um, it's less data. But the image side is coming online now. Um, and so that's a lot of AI is going into that, into image recognition. When you upload images into uh, Google Photos, many other pictures, Facebook, they find faces and they identify stuff. And so now that's working on video. And um, w what's really interesting is the look, and it can auto tag it, right? So it can go right to a moment and tell you that there's a tree there. Um, or that there's a change scene, or that the scene is predominantly blue, and all sorts of things like that. And the stuff that's coming out of that is just super interesting. Um, we think of our material in a certain way, but the machines see it in a different light, so to speak. And there's, I just think, giant, gigantic opportunities to use this to make all sorts of interesting, odd, new things. Yeah, well, in fact, last year, do you remember we were working with those guys in the states and it, in the end it just sort of didn't happen did it that they were trying because yeah that's what i mean they were trying to get a catalog of cleared rights and people who were willing to let people remix their material that and money, yeah. yeah but they actually cleared the rights of movies like fast and furious they had yeah. yeah that was about to be that thing it was a shame it didn't it? um i don't know how they try to fund yeah, it but it's They were making a plugin for Premiere and software that you used that would look into your e ed edit decision list. Yep. That's fascinating insights there. So what Brian's basically saying, I think, is that AI systems are coming on stream, which means that material of all sorts can be automatically tagged, which means that rights holders can identify where the material is being used, which might make it easier for us to use the material and they can get paid, so they'll be cool about that. So we might be going into a brave new world where the whole DNA of human culture is available to all of us to sample and mash up. We can be creative with it, and the people who own the rights can also get something out from it as well. This would be a brilliant future for sure. Gardner, what do you reckon? No. Well, no, let, let's, uh, let's throw it open to the audience. You guys uh, had a lot to take in there. You have questions on technique on on you know any aspect of, of what we've spoken about so far well there is revenue from YouTube you know if you get into the millions of views which some viral videos do then you can earn money from it. I, from, the from the advertising, it's not my favourite model, but you know it can kind of work. And you know there is a lot of there is good modern AV sampling. I, I do like Cassette Boy; he kills it. I think what, you know, it's kind of like with music. Say, if, if someone makes a, a bootleg and you distribute it to you and your mates, no one's too worried about it. If for some reason it sells a lot or in modern parlance goes viral and get several million views and some money's earned, then you should deal with the rights holders. So it can work both ways. But the problem is no one, that you can never draw the line between how much, between making money and not making money. And if that has to go to any court of law, then the person who is being focused on, who may not have any money, is immediately in a situation for two to three years where they're having to deal with a crippling situation of dealing out, dealing with the rights, who owns the rights, 
I mean, the stuff that I do, I just take it and I can barely pay my rent. You know, I'm not making any money from anyone. Uh, no, it isn't, but if you have a structure which is about, um, exactly, it's not. Um, but if you ha tell that to the person who says you use my film, that, you know, so I don't have an answer, but I'm not, I'm not pessimistic either. I just hope that I'm optimistic. They should, they should just let us get on with it. Yeah, right. If it makes any money, we'll give them a piece. Yeah, right. exactly, well, yeah. we've found actually that s some of our mixes uh, on YouTube, we've had copyright notices sent to us saying, you know, so and so has said you've used, you know, uh, but they've actually let us keep keep them online, but they state now uh, that, that you can't, not that you're wanting to, but they said you can't make money from them. So any monetizing of a video that's on YouTube from take, you know, from sample bits, uh, whoever the original copyright holder is, is you know, because sometimes I've seen mixes of ours have ads on them and things, and I think, oh, who's doing that? Because <laughs> I'm certainly not making anything from it. And then uh, when you go in and look at the, the messages that you're sent, it actually says, uh, whoever owns it, you know, 20th Century Fox or whatever, uh, but they are allowing you to leave this online, but you cannot monetize it. So, yeah, but they can. And I guess they just see it as extra advertising and, you know, and yeah. This stuff is just such bad news for the creative process. God knows it's hard enough to make something good as it is. It's hard enough to make a living. You do not want to be thinking about this crap if you're trying to make something. But the, yeah, exactly. So actually, the reality is we are fairly able to get on with doing it now without getting harassing, you know, letters to desist at all the time. And uh, like you say, if we make millions with something that's massive, then we'll, do, we'll have that conversation. But at the moment, we don't have to have it. I do sample from Google Images and shit all the time and make our, you know, we're doing a performance later upstairs, come on down for that. And, uh, you know, I've used the global DNA store, which we can search online. And it's a... It's a great state of affairs, let's face it, at the moment, you know? So we, let's leave the lawyers out of it. Keep, Brian, the cop, uh, keep the cop out of your mind. Brian, uh, what, what did Amazon say about the fish? Have they contacted you? Yeah, I, I talked to Amazon. So, you know, so the <coughs> just to change the topic here a little bit. So um, the thing about the, like, auto-tagging images is that there could be a whole new set of people involved in terms of monetizing videos online. Um, so if you think about, for instance, if you shoot some funny video of your kid after the dentist and you do that in a new in a Volkswagen Golf, Volkswagen may want to know that that video was shot in that car and then they can use that in their advertising. Um, so by identifying all, and there's so much video getting, it's like monumental, um, that there's all sorts of new people that are going to be part of this game shortly from the ISPs to different advertisers to everybody. If you make something and it's popular on the web, everybody wants a piece of it. There's like this whole weird ecosystem of people that are like parasitic culture around viral videos. It's I don't know I don't know if you've if any of you've encountered that you know they they represent some company and they just want to get exclusive use and they claim that they're going to get you millions of views and it's a whole strange ecosystem surrounding popular videos. Any more questions from the audience? There are quite a bunch today, huh? Oh, here we go. I mean, that's an interesting one because I guess if you extrapolated it out, then every video would have to have people that had people in it would have to be like naked, for example, and with no identifiable, you know, brands or anything. And in that case, I mean, that would be like free advertising, wouldn't it, for Volkswagen? I mean, that's would great, there be, yeah. and, and when you buy something like a car or, I don't know, a backpack or a, a Nike t shirt or something, I mean, does that, I mean, I have no idea, but does it like, is there like, you know, you buy it when it's yours, you can do whatever you want with it, and the, the manufacturer or the right holder can is that or they, can they still like control the use that you make of it or if you film it or you know <laughs> yeah I guess but I, yeah I just don't know how how it's protected unless you of course like you know burn it or something like that or say this is shit and, you know. and, and everybody's walking around with with like really good video cameras in their pocket and they're taking videos of their kid's birthday party and there's a coke logo in the background and or somebody's having a funny discussion at McDonald's. I mean, there's so many that they're going to want. That's why they're spending billions of dollars to develop this. It's not to help mashup artists. No, no, I guess not. <laughs> well, I mean, a good, a, a good example, only from last year, that's not, not uh, AV sampling as such, though, but uh, <laughs> that what you were saying was the, um, uh, with that Chewbacca mum. 
you know, the, the, and Disney slash uh, Lucasfilm, they were they loved it. They were over the moon. Of course, they could have said, oh, no, you mustn't do that. But, I mean, that had something like, I don't know, 100 million views in a day or something. And, of course, it, it, it gave Star Wars enormous publicity, of which, obviously, they had for free. And so, I mean, they, you know, they were very pleased at it. But it's... Um, Is that the exception, then? Because, like, there's been a tradition, hasn't um, there, with George Lucas, like, allowing fan films to... No. In the old days, yeah, you really, they, I mean, very litigious. But these days, I don't know, I think there has been a sea change. I think there's a whole new generation of guys in suits, I think, uh, at, at film companies who do just, you know, turn a blind eye and they let this stuff happen because they know it's sort of free publicity. Unless you're defaming or something like that or, or you know, I, I think in general the, 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 this stuff is being allowed now as long as you're not somehow making, you know, lots of money out of it. I think uh, a lot of the time they are just letting stuff go. The, the problem with, as soon as you start mentioning the law in any of these panel discussions, people cannot get off it afterwards, you know? That's the end of any creative discussion about sampling, about technology, about anything. It's all about, so what happens if they come after you? What about how much this is worth? What about making money? It's like, just get over it, get over it. We've all got to get over it. Let's get the copyright out of the way and then have s yeah. talk about something else. Good, I agree. Yeah. How would you feel about someone using your art videos in their AV set? Uh, that's happened quite a bit. And obviously we've got to say fair play to it, you know? So it, it's out there. It's, it's, the, it's the global mind. It's DNA. It's, we, we cannot wag a finger at that. It would just be too hypocritical, and you know, people do mash up our stuff, and I've seen stuff online, and I, you know, I, I've I've enjoyed it. Quickly, once you put something into the public domain, whether you like it or not, you've got limited responsibility over what happens and limited claim, regardless of what you say. Yeah, no, that's true. I'd say that I'd agree with both points. The only thing I find a, a bit annoying, but then again, it's you, there's nothing you can do about it, is because the scene still, as an art form, it, it's still not so easily recognized that anybody performing audio visually generally i think the public think oh that's that person doing it unlike a d you know a dj you don't expect that that person playing the records has created everything you know you go up to them and go oh i really like this tune who, who did this but you go somewhere and there's a screen and someone's performing audio visually you don't think oh i wonder who that av track is by you just don't and that that's that can be a slight problem for i think av artists is that people just go wow god this is amazing whoever's doing this and they could just be playing like all of our stuff and oh. not have created anything or if they sample you and it's really crap what they've <laughs> yeah, done <laughs> yeah, yeah that happens as well <laughs> but yeah i've I, you know it's happened to all of us i mean i've met people that other av artists that i've said oh yeah we did a track about xyz once and then they've said oh yeah, yeah i used it to open my set at blah 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 festival and you think oh really you know. well guys that, there's, there's no difference between djing and live performance actually there can be a difference but actually there's a whole spectrum there so i've done avj sets where i've just played other people's av pieces and you know it's not a live set it's a D, more of a dj set but the, the, all these categories are pretty much um, mashed up anyway nowadays, so just Guys, get on with it. I just want to let everybody know it's half past now, so the performances are starting across yeah. the hall and downstairs as well. Um, I think at this point, let's just uh, <laughs> let's dissolve it into the audience, yeah. and let's I think other conversations yeah. can happen free-flowing <laughs> style. Um, but thanks for all uh, having a chat and, and sharing you your ideas on the subject. Thank you. Thank you.